The Bison's top playmaker is in the transfer portal. Much more on Eli Green moving on. And the Twins just keep on winning. We got a big hot mic, and it begins right now. Hot mic with Dom Izzo. Really? Really, Dom? No. I like what Dom's doing. Okay. Dom Izzo. Jeez. Come on, Dom. What do you think I am, a magician? Yeah, I'm fired up, Dom. What else could I say? Absolutely. I was great to get on the field, and then Dom came up to me, and I'm trying to walk away from me. I just wanted to enjoy myself out there. Hot mic. Great job. <laughs> There's got to be some kind of intelligent question about something. Is a hot mic. Hot mic. On the networks of WDAY. You know, if it's not about sports, I find it very hard to concentrate. Here's Dom Izzo. Dom Izzo. Good Tuesday morning. Welcome to the winner's edition of Hot Mic on WDAY Extra. KSFL TV in Sioux Falls and in Forum.com on a Tuesday morning, the final day of April. We say goodbye to the fourth month of the calendar. Spring here. May right around the corner. It begins tomorrow, and then the fun months begin uh, for weather in this part of the world. Morning, everybody. I am Dom Izzo, host of said show. Welcome to Hot Mike here on a busy Tuesday. Lots happening already, and it's only 9 a.m. We already got uh, some breaking football commitment news. We got breaking college basketball news to get to. So uh, buckle up. We got a lot to uh, unpack over the next two hours. Also, as you heard in the tease to start the show, the North Dakota State football team was not able to get through the second portal window unscathed. The big news yesterday, as many of you seen, or heard or read that wide receiver Eli Green is in the portal. We're going to dive into that here in a bit and the implications, what it means for the 2024 Bison, where Eli could potentially go, and uh, the repercussions from it. We'll get to that in just a little bit. We also now know the Wolves have their opponent. We'll show you how Denver won in a second. Thrilling win there uh, by the Nuggets last night in knocking out LeBron James and the Lakers. We'll show you that here in just a few minutes. And the Force actually lost. I must have jinxed him. Comes to the territory if I talk about you long enough. Uh, Last night at home. So now they're going to have to go on the road and try and win the series in Sioux City. We'll get to that as well in just a minute. But team that doesn't lose, the Minnesota Twins. All they did for the first two and a half weeks of the season was lose. Now they get Carlos Correa back even earlier than we thought. We visited with Corey Provis about that on Friday. Said he's on the trip and he didn't play the weekend in Anaheim. He was activated before the game yesterday. Austin Martin was sent down. So you got one big gun back. But do they need him? They would roll through seven in a row prior to last night's game, and they just keep on winning. They keep on hitting, and more importantly, they keep on pitching. Now, granted, I know they're playing, but you still got to win the games. It helps when Carlos Santana's finally hitting the ball. Another home run, a two-run shot to left to tie the game at two in the second inning. This was a pitcher's duel because if you didn't get any – Runs early on, you weren't going to. Joe Ryan was great. Six innings, six hits, two runs, three strikeouts. And, of course, the rally sausage is there. We'll get to that in a minute. Two-all game in the eighth. Griffin Jacks with a big strikeout there to get out of a jam with two on to send the game to the ninth inning, tied at two. Jacks was solid in his one inning. Max Kepler, since he returned, all he's done is do this, clutch hit. After clutch hit, base hit here to score Byron Buxton. That gives the Twins a 3-2 lead in the top of the ninth inning. They would turn it over to Caleb Thielbar, who would get the chance to close it out. He gets the strike out here with two on. And the Twins win again, their eighth straight win. It is their longest winning streak since 2011. Now, I remember... 2011. The Twins won 63 games that year. They lost 99. It was their worst year in franchise history until 
whatever it was, 2018, I think, beat it. So I don't know if we're going to get too excited, but they won the game. Ryan, a no decision, but he was really good. Jax gets the win in relief. Santana now with his fourth home run of the year, and the Twins have won eight in a row. They've dominated the White Sox, who you see there, won 12 of their last 13 against Chicago and take the opening game of the set. And now have soared to two games over 500. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're still in fourth, but they're just a game back of Detroit and Kansas City. As you see the up-to-date standings in the AL Central heading into game two uh, tonight back at, can we say US, U.S. Cellular Park? I'm, I'm trying to think of all the old nicknames they had for <laughs> this stadium Uh over this set. Simeon Woods Richardson will start tonight. He'll be back on the mound and Michael Soraka will go uh, for the White Sox. You see he's got an 0-3 mark and he already near 7. Uh, Woods Richardson was really good. We talked about him with Corey on Friday uh, when he got called up and pitched well and he's going to be the guy with Louis Varlin getting sent down uh, to the minors after he got uh, roughed up in his last time out against the Tigers. So it's all clicking now and now you got Correa back who adds just a whole different element to the team, both offensively and defensively. I know he didn't get a hit last night, but just the aura of having him back is a huge deal for the team. So, slowly but surely, they're getting healthier. And when we said the season was over, may still be, I don't know, but at least they're playing better. Eight consecutive wins. I don't know what to say about the sausage. I don't want to go there too much. It's an odd deal. Baseball players are extremely superstitious and extremely weird. But uh, whatever works seems to be rolling right now for uh, the team in Minneapolis. Game two coming up tonight in Chicago. All right, now to the NBA. We knew on Sunday night the Wolves had their thrilling sweep of Phoenix News came out yesterday that Chris Finch is going to have surgery on his knee on that torn patellar tendon. Uh, it's, the surgery will happen tomorrow. That's according to ESPN. It remains unclear whether he'll be able to open the Western Conference semifinal against Denver on the bench. In the early stages of the rehabilita rehabilitation, Finch will be required to keep his right leg immobilized in a brace. Mike Inouye would likely be the guy taking over, and he was joking about this yesterday that maybe Finch is in the, the row behind the bench, and he's out there basically, as he called it, Pinocchio, uh, calling the strings there for the team. That is the only damper on what happened on Sunday. But now, as I mentioned, they know it is going to be a best-of-seven with the Denver Nuggets. Last night, Denver eliminated the Lakers almost in a carbon copy of what happened in Game 2. Game 5 last night, LeBron gave the Lakers a late lead up by one, but the Nuggets just make huge plays. Aaron Gordon is going to be a problem, and so is that guy, Jamal Murray, who is questionable to go in, a huge three to give the Nuggets the lead, and then the pull-up jumper here with three seconds left to give Denver the lead. LeBron doesn't even get the shot off. It's Torian Prince, former Wolf, who's short with that. And Denver wins it 108-106 to win the series and end the Lakers' season. Another huge shot from Jamal Murray. He won game two at the buzzer. This one not at the buzzer, but pretty darn close to give Denver the series win, and the world champs are still alive, winning it 108-106. So, we know three of the four semifinalists in the West, OKC, swept out the Pelicans last night. So they'll get the winner of Dallas and the Clippers. That series is tied at two apiece. That's going to go seven, the Dallas uh and Clippers series, just the way it's playing out, it's it's likely going to be seven. And we know the other semifinal will be Wolves-Nuggets. The Wolves Twitter account shortly after the game went final last night put up this image with 
Edwards and Jokic saying Western Conference semis with the popcorn emoji. Uh, and we'll break this full down later in the week because we got time. Because the NBA loves to drag this out as long as possible. Game one will not be until Saturday. Game two is Monday. Game three is not till a week from Friday at Target Center. So you got some time here to build this up. May 10th is game three. Game four will be Sunday, May 12th, Mother's Day, and then game five on May the 14th. We don't know the times, don't know the networks yet, but we do know game one will be Saturday to start the second round. And let's go. We talked about it during the regular season matchups between these two. We know the last time they played, Nuggets got Minnesota in a thriller in Denver. Nuggets got them in Minneapolis without Cat and without Nas Reed. It's uh, set to be what I think is a seven-game series. I really think it's going to go the distance. Do the Wolves have a shot? Absolutely. But to beat this team with the best player in the world, they're going to have to play even better than what they did in these four games against Phoenix. And they had some stretches, frankly, where they did not play well against the Suns. The Suns just didn't have any depth. Now, the, the Nuggets have depth, but just even last night, Michael Malone wasn't really going to his bench a whole lot. And Reggie Jackson played the most. He played 18 minutes off the bench, but Aaron Gordon played 46 minutes. Michael Porter Jr. is going to be a problem, played 46. Jokic played 41. Jamal Murray played 41. Contavious Caldwell-Pope played 33 minutes last night. He was the fewest in the starting lineup for Denver. I can't wait. I am jacked. I have a feeling there's a lot of people around the area that can't wait for uh, Nuggets, Wolves coming up starting on Saturday. Eastern Conference can see uh, quite a few series actually end tonight. The Pacers have the Bucks on the ropes. Indiana leads that series three games to one. The Knicks are up 3-1 on Philly. They can eliminate them tonight. Boston went up 3-1 on the Heat last night. Cavs and the Magic, the most <laughs> under-the-radar playoff series you can have. Nobody's talking about that one. Is tied 2-2. They play game five uh, tonight there. So we have three playoff series done, five remaining uh, in the NBA. Good stuff last night. All right, quickly to the hockey before we uh, set up our show. Sunday night, four Scotty. Impressive 3-1 win in Game 1, Western Conference Final. So last night was Game 2, same two teams. Another nice crowd. Force actually fell behind as Sioux City got the opening goal of the game to take a one-zip lead. The Force would tie it. A little rebound action in front that they would score and tie this game up. And one. That was the score. Jake Fisher scored there. Caden Shan will come in on a beautiful pass on a one-timer with just over six minutes to go in the third. That gave Sioux City a 2-1 lead. This is a fabulous setup, and Shan did not miss to make it a 2-1 Explorers lead. Or excuse me, Explorers. That's the baseball team. Musketeers. And then the empty netter here, one of two from Colin Kessler. And that iced it to give the Musketeers a 3-1 lead. They would win it 4-1. And even the series now at a game apiece with Game 3 coming up on Thursday night in Sioux City. Rare loss for the Force. They only lost 10 times during the entire regular season. First postseason loss as well after they swept out Tri-City in the first round. Now a loss here. So the next two games, it's guaranteed to go at least four. These are best of five, remember. So game three is on Thursday, game four on Friday. If there is a game five, that would be back in Fargo. That game will be played on Sunday at Shields Arena. So Sioux City evens it up with a win last night. We got a busy show coming up for you here today on this Tuesday morning. It is Tuesday, as I mentioned. Mike McFeely will be by at 930. We got lots to chat about with Michael, including the 
Bison loss in the portal. Also, the FCS playoff seating changes. We'll do that at 935. At 10 o'clock, Rachel Bergeson will join us, the AD at Concordia. If you missed the news late last week, the Jake, Jake Christian Stadium, with some major renovations coming to the tune of nearly $3 million renovations. New turf, new track, lights. I've been asking for lights for 15 years. Concordia is going to get it. We'll discuss that coming up at 10 o'clock. And just in at 1035, we just got confirmation on this. Uh, Isaiah Wright will join us. Fertile Beltrami standout running back who just literally about an hour ago announced that he is committed to play football for Bubba Schweigert and UND. He will join us in school to give us a few minutes at 1035 about his commitment to play for the Fighting Hawks. Dynamite football player. Uh, we actually televised Game of Theirs a year ago, 2022. We did the uh, Section 6 9 man final. I called that game, only reason I say that, uh, between Fertile Beltrami and Black Duck. He scored, I think, three touchdowns in the game. He had four touchdowns in a state semifinal game at U.S. Bank Stadium. He's pretty good. He'll join us coming up at 1035. That and a heck of a lot more here on our show this morning. We come back. The news not great for Bison football fans here. Eli Green is in the transfer portal. What it means and who's up on deck. We'll discuss that. Hot Mike is just getting started. We're back after this. Welcome back, everybody, here on this Tuesday morning edition of Hot Mike. Mike McFeely joining us in about 15 minutes. Uh, all right, Bison fans, probably time to rip the Band-Aid off to discuss the news that happened late yesterday. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it, read it. If you uh, follow any sort of local sports, you know that uh, NDSU junior wide receiver Eli Green entered the transfer portal yesterday. From what I was told, conversations were ongoing with Green and the coaching staff over the last couple of days, and... He made it known that he was looking to play at a higher level. From what I'm told, the staff tried to convince him. It's within a year of graduating. He's a fourth-year junior, about to be, um, but decided that he wanted to move on. And it's a de- it's is it devastating? I don't know. Is it? Tough? Absolutely. Is it unmanageable? I don't think so, but it certainly hurts. Now, Eli had a tremendous second half of 2023 to the tune of where anytime it was third and long, Cam Miller was going to go to him and he was going to make a catch. But for the early part of the year, up until I'd say Halloween, this was, he was just having a okay year. After Halloween is when things really started to click. And I think we have it in the other highlight video, Eric, if you can find that one. I think I give you the number on that. That it started, frankly, with the home finale against Southern Illinois. Eli made a catch there, and I think I sent that to you guys that he goes up and in traffic made a spectacular catch on third and 24 that changed that game and, frankly, changed his season around. Because he was okay to that point. This is the play. Ray up there. Went up and got it with two guys around him. And after that, Cam Miller knew to go to him. This was on a fourth down play at Northern Iowa. That he went and scored. And after that, I mean, we're talking outrageous. Four for 72 and a touchdown against you and I. Three catches, 91 yards, touchdown against Drake. Four for 63 against Montana State. He had one call back against Montana State, a holding call that was outrageous. That one had a catch he had against Montana. Five for 98 and a touchdown against the Grizz in the semifinals. Five for 116 against USD. And that's where he started to really blow up was the postseason. And we talked about it then. We talked about it in December. Like, well, Eli Green going to be hard to hang on to. But they did. 
They got him all the way through spring, as you see his season stats. Again, on the face of it, if, you're just, if you didn't watch a Bison game and you look at those numbers, you're like, well, that's nothing really to write home about. But the three touchdowns in the last five games is huge. And when he caught his passes is a huge deal. That you cannot overestimate or discount. And it's, it's tough. I, I'm not sure at this stage... I mean, you just wrapped up spring football, right? You think you have all your, you know, everything lined up, all set to go for the upcoming year. You got one day. The portal closes tomorrow, right? Midnight tonight. It's closed. Now, paperwork still has two days. So, in theory, we could still be seeing names go in for the next couple of days. But... You're thinking you got uh, the haze in the barn. We got everybody here. We're ready to go for 2024. And this is a tough blow. And for speedy guys like himself that can make acrobatic catches, there will be suitors. I would imagine there are power, and I say it now, power four suitors out there that are either already contacted or in the process of it. I think we're all smart enough now to know that when a player does this, that tampering has already happened. And again, I don't know how you stop it. There's no way to curtail it, no way really maybe even to prove it. There are burner phones out there. It's, it's a nasty business. Um, but I would imagine in the coming days, maybe even today, we'll start to see the offers on Eli's account of so-and-so offering, you know, Blessed to have an offer from so-and-so. I'm not picking on them. That's just how it works. And I'll say this. This is the hard part, and there's a couple emails I want to read here before we uh, go to break. That he was a front-facing member of the collective as well. Jay Bartley had, there was a few guys that he selected. We're going to talk about this with Mike in about 10 minutes. At the initial green and gold informational meeting they had in December. When 10 Miles came back uh, with San Jose State basketball, Eli was part of that. It was Cam Miller, it was Cole Payton, it was Eli Green, Kelton McCaslin. There's a few others, but those were, we, this is a guy we got to have. The kind of postseason he's having, he could be a huge piece in 2024. He's a former walk on as well, folks. He walked on from Farmington High School in the Twin Cities. He redshirted in 2021, had about a handful of catches in 22, including a touchdown in the championship game against South Dakota State. And then, as I mentioned, the first game of the year at U.S. Bank Stadium. People remember, he had a, there was a crossing route that Cam Miller threw to him. He bobbled it and then caught it again. He caught it twice. But I remember him telling me after the game that that really got my confidence going. And you saw that, I think, throughout 2023 the game at UND he had a monster catch down the sideline going left to right then he went up and got it it was fabulous he did that countless times and we're going to get into this with Mike about the the depth in the wide receiver room now because it leaves a considerable hole heading into 2024 now there are thousands of players out there literally there are 10,000 athletes that are in the portal now. So, I mean, you can you can find guys, but tough to me to find a guy that uh, replaces what kind of impact that, that Eli had on the team. A couple of emails I want to get to here on, uh, on this. Dom, now that schools will have a role to play in NIL, and that's a story that came out yesterday as well, is it possible for part of that role to be coordinated messaging? When you have players telling donors at fundraising events they're not leaving – then weeks later they leave, it undermines trust in the entire thing. No doubt about that. I'm not sure how you curtail it. These are 18 to 23-year-old men and women that are impulsive, that are going to get offered maybe huge gobs of money that they never thought in their life they'd see, certainly at that age. I could say I would raise my hand on that one if I got it 
put in front of me when I was 20 years old, yeah, I think I'm I'm going. <laughs> love my school, love my friends, but yeah, this is opportunity to, to do this. Yeah, I'm going to take it. But that's the that's the tough part for, and I I don't know what to tell fans. I don't to because there was a couple of comments that were really I thought prescient comments yesterday, and were worded really well to the effect of why. Why am I continually to set myself up for either heartache or heartbreak, knowing full well that there is no commitment from player to school? And I would say, frankly, that's been around for a long time with coach and school. So this is only uh, the tip of the iceberg on that. But I can get it. I, why, why would you spend your money? Why would you donate money to a place or department that it's as transactional as it is. And I would present to you professional sports are the same. People have no, you have no problem giving over gobs of money to go see the Vikings. Right. And you could say, well, Dom, that's professional. This is college. I'm telling you, we're moving in that direction. If we're talking about collective bargaining, if we're talking about unionizing, if we're talking about all of contracts, then we are in a, quasi-professional environment already, and we're getting closer by the day. I'm not here to tell you how to spend one's money, but that, it is a difficult road to hoe right now. I get it. You can be upset with all you want. Eli Green's a nice player, really good player. But he's here and he wants to play at a higher level. He thinks he can play at a higher level. He's being told by somebody around him that he can do this. And that's the catch-22 of this whole thing. You know, we've had a laundry list of guys, and I'm not picking on them, but it is fact now when you look at players that have left and where they have gone, how many have bettered themselves? It's less than a handful. It's not many. How many have gone to a lesser or equal place heck lot more of those we'll see i I imagine sometime today you'll start to see the offers start coming out and the bison now are left to figure out what they got to do at the wide receiver spot in 2024 we'll break our good friend mike mcfeely will join us other side of the break talk about this and much more we come back on a busy tuesday morning hot mike rolls on we're back right after this Oh, it's Mr. McFeely. I have seen the future, and he was wearing number five, and I ain't talking about Robbie Grimsley, folks. Took out the muffins, took out the trail mix, took out the cookies. They stole the monster cookies. Wow, that's awesome. (laughs) That is so awesome. Let's do some broadcasting. Oh, yeah. Our guy, Mike McFeely, joins us in studio. Are you making it out through okay? Porzingis got hurt last night for your beloved Celtics. That was a... A scary yeah, moment in the I McFeely household. It. Yes. Looked like an Achilles, Achilles I thought, they thought, right? But yeah. They're saying now that it's just a calf strain. <laughs> and he tweeted out last night, uh, all good. Okay. Thanks for oh. the thanks for the prayers. <laughs> thanks for the support. Well, he's good. I mean, the Celtics, yeah. I don't know if they need him, but he's really, really good yeah. for that team. They're, uh, yeah. I mean, the Celtics last night kind of just sort of lost interest in the game and got kind up by with Boston 25 does. <laughs> and this whoop boo is kind of floating around and let Miami back in the game and then said, well, okay, we'll just win by 15 instead of 25 <laughs> and just very but they do. strange, yeah. I enjoy, by the way, though, your wife Michelle was talking to you during the, the Lakers-Nuggets game yes. about how to how for the Lakers to oh, beat Denver. I, you know, I... I'm careful with what I tweet out about my my home life because it's you know it's, but I will put my wife up against anybody yeah. when it comes to watching an NBA game and you know talking the game talking I mean, basketball the two man game yeah like LeBron and and Anthony Davis <laughs> they got to stay with that two man game what are they, I mean what are they doing you know I mean just just she's run right. the two man yeah. game it always works and she's talking about. You know, got to get a stop here and, you know, got to throw it in the low post and, and kick it out. Get it away from Austin Reeves. I, I mean, don't just, let him just, shoot just, the I'm ball. Just like, wow, yeah. okay. 
She she knows her NBA. She watches a lot of NBA yeah, basketball. I knew that. She's a huge Celtics fan. Does she have and, any uh, leaning of Lake of Nuggets Wolves? Have you got any? Oh, she's a huge wolf. She's okay, a Minnesota so, so, girl. All right, she's Minnesota the girls bandwagon so, here. Yes, the game that her and our daughter went to in Boston. Uh, they went to a game in Boston or TD Garden in yep. January, and I set it up. I bought the tickets and made the plans. It was Timberwolves oh, at Celtics. Well, that was an all right game, and that was an unbelievable. <laughs> game and yeah my daughter said that it, in the fourth quarter when uh uh oh anderson the guy the guy for the wolves kyle anderson kyle anderson slow-mo, yeah yeah my wife looks at our daughter and goes slow-mo is killing us <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's fantastic <laughs> yep so uh what do we make of this series here we got jokic which the team best are we play- talking about wolves, wolves oh, nuggets okay. here jokic right. against uh, and I mean, this is going to be fantastic. It's going to be pretty good. May um, basketball at Target Center. I thought Center. the Nuggets struggled with the Lakers yeah. more than they needed to. I thought that the Lakers really had an opportunity to win way more than yes. one game of that series. They led every game. And at the Nuggets have a bunch of guys who are limping around on one leg. It's yeah. like the you know, it's like a, the the sweeping scene from Gone with the Wind in the you know Civil War. <laughs> guys limping around on crutches and one leg and everything else. <laughs> um, that's kind of the Denver Nuggets right now. Uh, I like where the Wolves are. Yeah, Anthony Edwards is becoming a star. I mean, th- th- driving over here, Dan Patrick. That his entire segment on Anthony Edwards. No kidding. On the Dan Patrick well, the, show. When's the last time they had any, any kind of national radio on the Timberwolves? Yeah, Wolves? probably twenty about years. Twenty years ago, right? right? I mean, so it's he's good. Oh, um, fantastic. And so it's it's going to be a fun series. May it's, basketball at Target Center. That's going to be a scene next. Yeah. Uh, what is it? A week I mean, from I was, Saturday or whatever I mean, it is. I, I was I covered those games yeah. back in the day. I was there when Kevin Garnett, Garnett scored thirty two against the Kings or whatever in Game Seven. It was insane. And now it's this it's is, back. It's going to be. It's, it's the be state great. of basketball, it is. Dom. It is. It's all this you know marketing crap. State of hockey. You know we're wild. Always been yeah. the state of basketball in Minnesota. Always has been. So it's going to be Boston and who in the NBA Finals? Uh, I'm not sold on Boston. Really? The way they're playing these playoffs. The Knicks? Uh, maybe the Knicks. Oh, Knicks are pretty good. Love it. Would That's, love that if that came to pass. Oh, Knicks Celtics. That's the, the next goal, yeah. by the way. I've told my wife and daughter our MSG? next goal is going to a Celtics Knicks mm. game in Madison Square Happy, Garden. That's our my party. daughter and I. My daughter, by the way, has quite the life because yeah. in December yeah, yeah. we went to her and I That's went right. to New York on a dad daughter trip for like six days. <laughs> She was looking up. She's like, hey, Dad, uh, the Knicks don't play when we're there. I'm like, oh, I didn't know you're interested. Oh, it's Madison Square Garden. Yeah. I'd go there. Oh. So she's looking up the Rangers games. Oh. I'm like, really? She's like, what's, what's the name of the hockey team? The Rangers? I go, yeah. Oh, oh, they're out of town, too. I'm like, okay. I, wow. I, That's fantastic. Yeah. I, well, let's talk about the news, the Bison football news uh, that came down. NDSU couldn't get out of the portal window unscathed. Uh, that came down yesterday that wide receiver Eli Green is in the portal. Uh, from what I'm told, that he's been, he believes he can play at a higher level. And yeah. let's go first on the Bison side of this. How big a blow is this for the Bison offense? Well, it's pretty big. I mean, they it, all indications were they were going to center the passing game around Eli Green. Smart. And that, <laughs> and that would also open up the running game, which is, if you remember a couple of years ago, they didn't quite have that guy to go to. And it cost them because teams would put eight guys in the box and they just couldn't throw the ball downfield. And especially after Hunter Lipke got yeah, hurt, it just yeah. it just didn't work. No, nope. uh, Eli Green is going to be that guy. Which, which by the way, is again, it just it's sort of. I, I understand what he's doing. That you know, you want to go play at a higher level. And I'm I'm making the assumption. I don't know this. I'm making the assumption that he's not going to the portal blind. Right, I, I talked mean, about I, that earlier. I mean, yes. I don't. I mean, nope. I don't think so. No, no I mean, way. Some of those guys, like the the DJ Hearts and the Courtney Eubanks and the Dom Jones, Dom Ganella, those guys went in crossed. blind. Yep, yep. And just it's like, okay, who wants yep. us? Yep. And they found out that really their market value wasn't that great. I'm assuming that, especially the way that Eli Green was sort of one of the guys they focused on. With the with the green and the gold right. collective and Eli Green was at that meeting I back in about that. December. Yep. I mean, so there must have been something, you know, some contact, you know, illegally from somewhere to let Eli know that he was Coveted. wanted at yep. a higher level. But it, it just 
he was going to be the center of the North Dakota State offense in the passing game. They were going to have a quarterback who has been here now for five years who's pretty darn good in Cam Miller. The backup quarterback, Cole Payton, is pretty darn good. The Bisner expected to be, I'd say, the second or third best team going into the season in FCS. Right. And so you were yep. going to – you're going to have 50 catches or more this year. Seven, eight touchdowns. From, from yeah. a school that, again, what Matt Ensign always, we, we put guys in the NFL. You can go from the NFL, from Fargo to the NFL. You don't have to necessarily go someplace else. And so you're, yep. you're kind of taking a sure thing and turn it into a, you know, even if he goes to Minnesota or Iowa State or Nebraska, you, you don't know what you're going to be when you go there. You're, right. you're going to be playing Power 5 football. And I, I, don't, I don't know that he is or isn't a Power 5 player. I truly don't know. I, I'm, I'm curious to see where Eli ends up. You know, I mean, I, right. I, I, just, yep. I just don't know. Yep. But I don't know that you're going to be the featured guy if you go to Iowa State where Tyler Roll and Noah Pauly are. And, and I don't know if that's... I don't again. I'm not. Man, you can make be some connection anybody, there, right? But yep. I don't yep. know what's going on. That, um, but that, kinda, that one just is obvious that right. it would, like, oh, okay, right. it would make sense. Those kind of guys, though, Mike, and I'm talking the the size, speed. Are, are they not a dime a dozen at that level? Yeah, but he's good. I he's mean, really he's, good. You know, yeah. he, he's not like a burner. I mean, he's not like a guy where you go, wow. Right. Like Christian Watson. When Christian Watts, Watson ran, you went, oh my god. Yeah. He is faster than everybody else in this building. Example, Montana State, two. 2019. Right, I mean, and yeah. bigger and just, yeah. just, I mean, he looked like a monster out there and way faster than everybody else. Eli Green, unbelievable ball skills, can go up and get the football and can catch the football, which is a key for a receiver. Catch the ball. Yeah, he and he did that against Montana, oh. Montana State, everybody. Southern Illinois. Southern Illinois. Illinois. Oh. I mean, he did. I mean, so there's obviously yep. a lots of talent there. I just, it, it it just always baffles me with some of these guys, where it's we we assume he's getting paid by the collective. He's going to be the center of the offense, the passing game. He's going to have multiple opportunities to catch the ball in every game. I assume that they're you know they're, they're going to. I haven't talked to Tim Palsek about it. I assume that they told him. You're going to be the center of the <laughs> offense, <laughs> right? Jet sweep kind of yeah, guy, jet, right? You know? I mean, all of those yeah. things. So you're going to touch the ball six times a game as a receiver, right. somehow, some way. And so, if even if you go to Iowa State or Minnesota, are you going to catch? Are you going to have the opportunity to run jet sweeps? Right. And I, I don't know I, that I you are. Think so no. So I I don't know. So we have a graphic here of the returning receivers now on the roster. For 2024, right. minus green. Braylon Henderson is back. Raja Nelson, Makai Collins, Bryce Lance, Chris Harris, all combined had 50 receptions last year. Eli and his own had, I think, 45, 43. Like yeah, yep. Collins, Lance, and Harris have one career reception. So that's Nelson and Henderson carrying yep. the mail there. But you, we had a text exchange yesterday. One of those bottom three guys is going to have to have a big yeah. time year. Yeah, big and, time and step North up Coast here. North Dakota State made an offer to a the former Mr. Football in Minnesota yeah. who was a walk on at Minnesota, uh, Osterman, Kate or Osterman, Osterman, yep, from Elk River. And, and, yep. But I don't know, yeah. you know, I mean, who knows right. what that is or what not that what who who he is or whether he's ready to go and contribute. Um, but yeah, they're they're right back in that same boat that they seem to be <laughs> every year yeah. when Who's, they don't have. Christian Watson or yeah. Darius Shepard that you just kind of wonder, okay, who's going to catch the ball? And Raja had a great second half. That were yeah. even five-game stretch from... But a lot of that was in the running game, right. though. That was not... That was not like getting downfield yeah. and stretching the field. It was the running game. He had a couple downfield, though. Like Northern Iowa, remember, he had the deep throw, oh, yeah, throw yeah. down there. Yep, 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 yep. But more, more often yeah. than not, yes. Now, Collins and Lance had great springs. Collins didn't have a great end of the spring. I yep. thought Bryce had a pretty good game. Those guys are huge, six three, six four guys that are yeah. gonna be. They're different than what Eli Green is. They're gonna need somebody like that to yeah. really and have I mean, a big year. College football is college football. I mean, it's still that part of it's still the same. That you always lose guys in yep. college football, even before the portal. You always had guys graduate, and you always had needed younger players to step up. It's just that this one, 
you know, you and I were texting yesterday. This one was just like, I'm just like, really? I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't yeah. get this one. I didn't, yeah. I get a lot of them. This one, I'm like, yeah. Mm, I don't know that you're going to get a quarterback that's going to be as experienced and accurate as Cam Miller is, who knows you and who's worked with you. And I, it just, I don't know. Yeah. It, but again, if Wisconsin is saying, come here and you're going to get $500,000, hey, go, go yeah. for it. I mean, yeah. God bless you. I mean, good I, for you. And I would imagine, as I said, we're going to break here, that either today or tomorrow we'll start to see the offers yeah. come out, I would imagine. I'm a little surprised we haven't seen them yet. Yeah, frankly. I, again, I just I I'm assuming that there's yep. something contact has been made. That contact has been made. <laughs> that there's I would hope there's even something in place. Bingo. I, I yes. Mean, and that's right. it's not legal. It's but no. It, but but that's the I deal. Mean, that's the, that's right. the way it works. Let's break. We come back. The maybe I'll use the word surprising news that Grant Nelson is going to come back and use his final year of eligibility at Alabama. We'll chat with Mike about that. He wrote about it yesterday. We wrap up hour one of Hot Mike. We do it right after this. Welcome back, everybody. You're seeing video of Devils Lake's own Grant Nelson, who you're going to get to see back in the SEC next year. He announced yesterday that he is returning to Tuscaloosa for his fifth year of eligibility. Uh, the Grant Nelson beat writer is actually right here. <laughs> One might wow. be feely. I'm sorry you're not going to get to go to the NBA Combine again this year. I that thought was you might, right. right? That, was, that, was that was a pretty was, good trip. That was a pretty good trip. Oh, yeah. on, on the range of surprise scale, 1 to 10, I was surprised. Were you? Um, I was flat out wrong. I thought he was gone. Yeah, you and I talked yeah. about it, uh, I think, last week or the week before, yeah. that we both, if we had 100 bucks to bet, right. we would have bet that he was leaving yeah. for various reasons that we've talked about. Um, but, no, he's, he's coming back, which, I, you know, I don't know. It's indication of, again, they, they – go through those tests that they the NBA management sends out to the college players, the athletic tests or something they're called yep. or whatever. And so maybe that came back as not as favorable as one would hope. Um, is there something going on we don't know about in terms of, you know, I, I don't know, I sprained ankle mm. or I don't know. I mean, I don't know yeah. um, that he has to work through. Is there... Is it just that he enjoys playing for Nate Oates because it's financially? No, it's probably got to be it's probably financially. There. He's probably doing okay, yep. and it's going to yep. be better this year after his performance Correct. in the um, in the NCAA tournament. So I I don't know. Yeah, Alabama was certainly excited about. It. They had several different tweets, including <laughs> this one they put out uh, just yeah, with, with, with the mustache yeah, how about from, that? from the Crimson Tide men's basketball account with the roll tide. Next and Mark to it there. Sears, the the outstanding guard, is also. He he's put in for the NBA draft, right. but could return. Like he can come can. back. Yep. But apparently Grant Nelson did not put his name in. No. So sources tell me, as they say, that he did not even put his name yeah. in the in the hat. He again, just decided he was going back to Alabama. I was wrong on that. I would have put yeah. again. I would have put a hundo on him. Yeah. Him doing both of those things. But I mean, God, I mean, if, yeah. Let's just throw a number out there. Okay. Let's make up a number: six hundred thousand dollars. Okay. If he's making. Five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand dollars at Alabama. That's more than you're going to make playing in the G League, correct? Or going to Europe. It's a lot more these days, from what I understand, that you're going to make going to Europe. That's one point two mil over two years. years. And so, <laughs> if you're looking at it long term, you're going well. Let's make this money now while we can, and then yep. it's a sure thing. And then we'll. I don't. I don't know the thing. Yeah. I haven't talked to Grant. Yep. I haven't talked to his family. I don't. I don't know what's going on. But he gets another year of this, and this time next year, then it's will be go time to see yeah, if this is last year. You know if this will work. I I am intrigued to see the kind of team he has around him this coming year. Of what I, I'm not a great I, Alabama basketball mind, but, but, who, but, but who knows? Right. Because it's Nate Oates is a very much of a transfer. Oh, point. he's a transactional guy. I mean, I mean there. they they are. Yep. Everybody at at the Power Five you level have to be now. in yep. college basketball. Yep. It's a new team every year. That's and the quicker you understand that. The better off you're going to be. That yep. you can't, you know, wistfully hope for the old days of four years ago, <laughs> when, when when you could, you know, build a team oh, through longingly look back at those, you know, have yep. guys on the roster. It yep. just doesn't work that way. So all these coaches, yep. Nate Oates, everybody's just like, you know what? New year, new team. Yep. It's the way it's going to work. You watch the NBA more than I do. How does 
How does this game translate now, and what needs to happen between this time he shot now to next year? 27%, I think, from three-point range this year. I think, or maybe it was 37. Either way, it was not good. It yep. wasn't, wasn't nearly good enough. Um, he's not a good enough shooter. So that's one. That's one, okay. and he play, needs to play defense. Okay. And he needs to get stronger. <laughs> but he's athletically, right. it's all there. Yeah. And, and, and you wonder, again, with the defensive side of things, and I'm, again, I'm not an NBA scout. I'm not a college scout. I'm not a high school scout. <laughs> but you wonder if the foot speed and the strength is there to play defense in the NBA. Right. I mean, you look at, I mean, watch an NBA game and look at the guys they have on the perimeter. Look at Jokic. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, LeBron James is 900 years old and he is murdering guys driving down the lane. At 39. I mean, yeah. he is killing people. Yeah. And nobody can stop him. His trouble is he's 39 years old. Right. And he's not quite the jumper and the athlete he used to be. Right. But he is so big and so strong that, I mean, yeah. it just, it's, it's incredible. It's a freight train. Yeah, freight train I coming on the out, lane. Get out speed. of the way. Uh, real quick before we go, uh, one of our favorite punching bags is the FCS Playoff Committee. They finally have signed off on expanding yeah. the seating which I would think is going to eliminate the regionalization part of the of so. the tournament, that we actually have a true 1 versus 16 maybe yep. in the second round of the tournament, 2 versus 15. You eliminate what we saw last fall, where Montana State is a 6 seed, is looks at its bracket like, wait a minute, North Dakota State is there, who we thought the Bison could have been seeded yeah. last year, could have been the 8 seed or the 7, and they ended up being unseeded. That, well, I mean, under this format, would go away. Who, I mean, we've talked about this before as well, but who this is going to help oh, is there's no doubt. the teams in the Valley the and big the Big Sky. Sky. No doubt. Right? Yep. I mean, North Dakota last year, no, they were uh, they were uh, at large, yep. so they didn't have any standing. But their first game is a decent Sacramento yeah. State team. Yep. Right? I mean, Correct. That, that will not I mean, happen now. No. I mean, you can... And they whined and complained for two years about the Weber State thing. I got so tired of that. Yep. It's like you can, there's nothing that says you can't win a road game. <laughs> you, you can actually go there and not give up 38 points in the first half. <laughs> Correct. But but last year it's like, well, okay, so they get their home game and they yep. they made sure they got their home yep. game and they spent 150 grand, and then they have Sa Sacramento State come in. Well, I mean, North Dakota State has Drake. Yes. You know. So. Yep. I mean, it is what it is. Yep. And again. There's nothing saying you can't beat Sacramento State because Sacramento State the next week went, went to, down and got pounded by million. South Dakota. Yeah. You yeah. know, so the Sac State yeah. obviously wasn't that good. Right. It uh, will result in now teams from the Ohio Valley, the Northeast Conference, the, the Patriots, the Southern Conference. So the, yeah. Southern, the Southern Conference to me is the conference that has benefited most from regionalization. Oh. Gosh, yeah. Because they... We, we've seen teams come here every yep, year. I mean, they're, yeah. they're fine. You know, Samford a couple of years ago was fine. East Tennessee State, they had their best team ever. They were fine. You know, they were like a fifth or sixth place team in the Valley, yep. which is fine. But their first couple of games were just like, really? <laughs> I mean, they're playing yeah. whomever, Ohio Valley. Gardner-Webb. Gardner-Webb. Eastern I mean, Kentucky. Now, yeah. presumably, the Southern, the SoCon champ, if they're not seated... Are going to have to play, although they seem to always get a seed for yeah. some reason. But whatever, <laughs> it'll be good. I think this will help. I, I'm intrigued I to see how the bracket will turn out when we get to November. On that now, so. I, I just it's I, NDSU football is in a weird place. I, I just I don't know that the intensity what, what we saw from 2011 to 2021. Ain't never coming back. That white hot. It yeah. just, it's never coming back. Yeah. They could do better than they have the last couple of years in terms of marketing and drawing new fans to the stadium. But if you are somebody who's waiting for that, you know, 2017 feeling to come back, it just is not going to. Yeah. And one of the reasons why is because of what's left in FCS, that it's going to be four teams this year <laughs> that you think are going to be pretty good. In the two Montanas and the two Dakota states, and the same four from last, yeah, and, right. And outside of that, who else is going to be there? Uh, I don't. I just. I don't know. Yep. I just don't know. Yep. I mean, and I don't know long term. I mean, God bless Bubba Schweigert and UND, but look at the hits. I mean, we, you know, we're talking about Eli Green. Yeah. Look at the hit UND has taken in the portal Correct. on the offensive line. If if you're an FCS and you can't keep your linemen, I, 
What chance do you have? Right. right. And I don't know that NDSU is going to be able to in the future either. Correct. Just because it, just because of this one time. Right. Yeah. So it's just, it, I don't know what you the know. future of FCS is. That's a good segue to do that next time. Thanks for coming by. <laughs> Great to see you, my man. You Appreciate it. Mike McFeely joining us each and every Tuesday. We'll break. We come back. Some major renovation plans coming to the Jake over at Concordia. We'll visit with Rachel Bergeson from Concordia when hour two of Hot Mike begins. We'll do that right after this. This is Hot Mike. Hot Mike. On the networks of WDAY. WDAY. Here's Dom Izzo. Welcome back, everybody. Hour two of Hot Mike, ready to rock and roll on this Tuesday. You'll meet UND's newest football commit from Fertile Bell Trammy. Isaiah Smith will join us. Or is that, yeah, I get the name right. He's coming up. He'll join us at uh, Isaiah Wright. Excuse me. I got too many Smiths, Davis all around. Isaiah Wright will join us at 1035. Mentioned off the top of the show, uh, the major renovation project that's happening over at Concordia, nearly $3 million renovation that will be done, at least part of it, track and new turf on the football field uh, by the end of the summer, which is uh, good timing considering the football team plays uh, in early September. We haven't had Rachel Bergerson on in forever, so it's great to see her back in Cordia, athletic director. I was joking with you off air. I drive by the Jake probably two or three times a week, and I saw something was happening over there. Like, I got to call her, and then, bam, here's the news. Tell us uh, how this all came about. Yeah, it's that's kind of exactly what we're hoping happens when people drive by <laughs> 8th Street and and something's happening at Concordia College and and that's why uh, we're excited to announce this project. We are redoing our track completely. So not just a resurface but the subsurface as well and um returfing our football field as as you know, turf only lasts so long. Uh, and so we are due for a replacement. Um, but I think the the other piece that we're adding that not many people know yet is light. Yes, yes. Um, I've and been, we're really excited I've about been that. screaming about this for 15 years to Terry. Uh, was this a high priority for you to get lights? I would say it was a priority. Okay. It was one of many priorities. And, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is we sometimes run out of daylight for our own practices yep. um, late in October and early November. But we really think this will open up an opportunity for people within the community to use the space. Um, and then there's always, you know, the, what we do every year is we evaluate sports sponsorship and what sports, you know, should we sponsor at Concordia? And so if we ever do add say men's or women's lacrosse, um, we will be prepared to have nighttime practices and competitions. Does this mean, I know the MIAC has a pretty strict policy about when you play football. Could you do that? Could you play a night game? We can. And so there was one um, specific event with lightning that we were concerned about daylight and we did get it in, uh, but we were concerned. And so it is possible to do. Okay. Um, and then if we host multiple things on a Saturday and we have to move a football game back, we can play under the light. So mm. it does give us some flexibility. Um, and even for practice times, it gives us some more flexibility and then, and therefore hopefully some less missed class time too. I want to ask about the turf. I I was there, Rachel, when it went in. This is I'm date myself in 2010. How long had this been on the docket to say we got to get this done? We got to we got to get an up an upgrade here. Yeah, so it's I mean it's been on the calendar really since we put it in because it has it it has a lifetime to it and it has an end date to it. Um, and, and, you know, we start to see more slipping, we start to see, you know, a little bit more of that, even just during training and, and practices. And so it's been on the schedule, uh, super grateful for President Irvin and our Board of Regents for their support to move ahead with the project in this timeline. Um, I don't even think President Irvin had been on campus for more than a couple of weeks, and this was already going to happen. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And the track has been on the calendar for even longer. Okay. Yeah, we were, it was offline for us, um, and we haven't hosted a competition since 2019. Holy cow. So we're really excited uh, for our track and field athletes um, and, and now for the community, too, because people are always looking for an outdoor track. And now this isn't just exclusive for Concordia. Tell us the Oak Grove part of this and how they work into it. 
Yeah, what a beautiful connection. We are we are connected to Oak Grove in many ways um, on the academic side, and now we can proudly say on the athletic side as well. And we just happen to have the same colors, so <laughs> it works out perfectly for both um, organizations. And really, the overlap in the seasons is not much, and even when there is one, the facility allows for it. So we're really excited to meet a need that they had uh, with our current project. Is there a chance, I mean, maybe this has been discussed about them playing football there as well? I know they're, they're still in transition of trying to find a suitable fo home for football for them. Yeah, you know, we've talked about football and it certainly can be something that we can continue to talk about. I know that they love the you know. beauty of their football field. Um, and so we'll see where football takes them in the future, but it's it's certainly an option. And I think lights would allow <laughs> for that. Um, it's harder to share a football field than it is a track, yep. um, but nothing is impossible, especially when you have great partnerships. Tell me with uh, Coach Horan's reaction about the lights and the new turf, what was his reaction on this? You know, one of my favorite days of the year last spring was the day I got to go out to football spring practice and tell them about this project. Mm. And the cheers we got when we said we were getting new turf was great. And then when I shared lights, these kids came unglued, including <laughs> my head football coach. And so it it just it eases a lot of issues and concerns for our athletes it makes it feel more like a college facility um and and then of course i got to step into a track and field team meeting yeah. and i mean i think i even saw some tears from those kids because they've been <laughs> waiting for this project for so long and um they were more than patient with us um and so it was it was just such a treat to I, share i don't i should know this off the top of my head how many other mayak football stadiums have lights I'm trying to think of this. I know St. John's does. I'm trying to think of who else does. Yeah, I think there's just a couple. Okay. So we will be in the minority. Okay. Um, but I also think what what a great thing, right? Yeah. Like we're ahead of our times and um, certainly have more flexibility. So we just saw the video out there. The construction is already underway. Give us the timeline of when you'll hope to have this. I was mentioned off the top. You got to have it done, obviously, by August. What What's the timeline for you? August 1 is okay. the date that we've set. Um, you know, it, we did have to adjust some of our spring practices to allow for the construction to start, but we really wanted to prioritize getting it done on August 1st because um, it's really hard to move anything in the fall. So um, August 1st, so we're praying for really great weather this <laughs> summer. Um, and there's some cure time with tracks. I mean, when you do that first layer, you have to give it... 30 days no to kidding. cure. And okay. So there's some cure time. And, but um, we've noticed that so far the, um, you know, the demolition has gone really fast and, and really quick. So we are, I'll say quote unquote ahead of schedule <laughs> and then I'll knock on wood on my desk. Um, but August one is the deadline. So if people were to come back and I know they do uh, um, homecoming weekend and they've been gone for five or six years, if they look at the baseball stadium and that, and then look what's going on, they probably won't even recognize what you've done, right? They won't. Yeah. And even our jumbotron, our yeah. big scoreboard. And I think that was, that was also a, a big reason why we wanted to do these projects early on is it's so visible from eighth street. And you can tell now that you've arrived at Concordia College and you can tell that uh, Cobber Athletics is alive and well. Um, and so, yeah, they won't recognize it and they'll be <laughs> jealous that that our current students got it and they didn't. But um, that's also what you have to do. You have to keep moving. And I, so I think they'll, they will also be really proud that even during some tough, challenging times in higher ed, Concordia is on the move. I got an email to ask you if soccer would be able to play under the lights on the football field. Oh, that's a really good question. So, um, and, and that's another project down the pipeline <laughs> um, because we actually can't fit a legal soccer field okay. in that space due to, well, we have the, the track, but then where our grandstand lies and moving those concrete grandstands would have been quite the process. Yeah. And it really, to be honest, I think we need an additional turf facility okay. um especially if we're going to consider adding sports um and so i i would hope that in the next phase of things that we can look at what a turf soccer field would look like because it's also two fall sports 
Um, whereas say lacrosse yeah. would be a spring sport and it's just easier to overlap. So I think the best answer that I can give there is no, because it doesn't fit okay. and B they deserve their own. Mm. You've mentioned it now a couple of times. So I got to ask you, are you adding lacrosse? You know, we're <laughs> not right now, okay. um, but it is something that, that we're seriously looking at and it needs to be something that we continue to seriously look at because of, the growth that we're seeing in area high schools no and also area club programs at the high school level. Um, and I think as well, I don't like to be last in anything, Dom, <laughs> and I certainly don't want to ever be last in adding a program. And so when we added women's hockey in the nineties, we were one of the first, and I won't tell you how old I was <laughs> when we added women's hockey, but I've certainly done uh, the work to read up on how Concordia did that and why they were a part of that initial group. And so I think it's something that we're going to continue to talk about and we're going to keep tabs on within our conference schools because obviously they're going to be our closer competition. And um, yeah, I think we want to make sure that if we do it, we do it right and we do it well. Um, and so it is a it is a constant conversation. Seeing what the Spuds have done, Rachel, over the last five years since they added it, I'm and, and the amount I know the amount of kids that come out for more at high that has to say okay we have a pipeline here in town right it, it is and yeah. my frequent conversations with AD Dean Helgo uh, are also helpful and kind of learning how they've yeah. done it and um, how they've done it well um, and their numbers are great um, I think there's also some other nuances that we have to consider do we have officials available. Yeah. Um, you know, what kind of, we have to get that facility piece figured out first. And so again, I want to make sure that we do it right and we do it well. Um, but we have to continue to talk about it. So I got you here. I want to ask just uh, division three challenges as an athletic director, <laughs> what's uh, you come in, like what's number one on your, on your, on just overarching in D three right now. Yeah. Well, I would say stabilizing budgets. Yeah. Um, and, but I would almost say that for almost every level. <laughs> I mean, maybe the power five doesn't have the same <laughs> challenges that I do. And I think it could be the same challenges just that different, different levels, varying levels. Um, but that's always going to be, you know, a part of the division three world. And, I would say I feel a lot of support on our campus and a lot of support from our alums. And I really can't end this interview without thanking all of our donors and the people that have contributed to this project, but also Cobber Athletics in general, because that's how we can provide the experience that we're proud to provide. Um, and so I, I would say that that's a number one. I think I think about dollars and look at dollars most every day, because that's how we do the things that we do. Um, but I just want to be able to provide a really good experience for these students. Last thing before I let you go, last week I saw this. It looks like it's going to happen. The Division Three football tournament is going to be expanded to 40. Tell me about the thoughts of that, and Concordia is now opportunity. We can get in. We, we can be one of the 40 schools into the tournament next fall. I'm really hoping that what the expansion will do is get the right teams in. I think we have, you know, some leagues that, you know, even their automatic qualifier wouldn't be within the top 40 mm. in the country. But of course, it's an automatic qualifier. And that's a big deal for the, that particular conference as well. And so I'm hoping with some expansion of the at large bids that we have the right teams in, it makes it for a really competitive championship experience. Um, and then, you know, maybe a team can make a run that wouldn't have even gotten in. Does that expand the year at all, Rachel? Is there, it, does it expand the season from what you know? A little bit. Okay. Um, but, it, you know, thankfully in the with the fall sport, we do have some space and time for it. Um, you know, my concern anytime we do expand or lengthen is multi-sport athletes, which at our level we have quite a few right. of. And at Concordia, I'm really proud of how many that we do have. And, um Truthfully, Don, I think our teams have been more competitive the more multi-sport athletes we've had. Mm. And so I don't I don't want to lose that model or at least lose the opportunity for kids to choose that if they want it. Um, but I also am excited for the expansion of, yeah. of the field. Lastly, uh, where we stand on a Dragon Cobber football game. We any closer to that happening? Oh, wouldn't that be fun? Yes. You know, I our football schedule right now in our conference matrix we're currently in a did that divisional model yep. um and then 
we are moving back to a nine game conference okay. schedule, uh, which only, it, it, and there will still be a divisional type model to that, but um, it'll be a nine game schedule. So we'll only have one non-conference game. And what we're learning now with pairwise, which is the, the programs that they're using now to determine um, strength of schedule at large bids is we, we really need to play a division three opponent yeah. and they have to be a good one. Mm. Um, and so while it would be financially responsible to stay in town and walk across the street and then also maybe provide a, a cool community event, um, we, we need to schedule a division three opponent. So we're a little bit, our hands are a little bit tied. Yeah. Um, but I hope we can keep talking about it. <laughs> I'll keep my fingers crossed. I got UND and NDSU to play football. I'm trying, I'm, this is my last goal to get the Cobbers and the Dragons to play football. Sometime before my son reaches high school, he's five. Can we can we do that? <laughs> okay, I well maybe. I, I mean, I hope I'm still around. I don't know what it looks like, but um, yeah, I yeah, I, maybe I should bring you to our conference hey, meeting. Um, I'm I'm always available. You got my number, so um, it's great to visit with you. Appreciate the time, and uh, I can't wait to see the lights go up over there. It's going to be fantastic. We'll visit again soon. All right. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Rachel Bergerson, Bye. Concordia Athletic Director, joining us here this morning. $3 million project that's uh, underway, as you saw over at Concordia, that will have new turf, a new track, and lights. Lights is the is the BA part of it for me because there are numerous times where there's been section football games over there that you'd have to kick off super early because, especially in November, because you couldn't play. And then those games went to more at high because obviously they did have lights. There's an opportunity there for a Section 8 playoff game now to be played at the Jake. That would be cool. That's pretty cool stuff. And again, on the D3 expansion, it's not finalized yet, but it's going to the President's Council. Normally, if it's advanced that far, it's a rubber stamp, and it'll be a 40-team Division Three postseason happening this fall. In, uh, in Division Three football. We're overdue for a break. We'll take one now. Get caught up on a couple things. Got some emails to get to as well. Hot Mike continues. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Our thanks to Rachel Ferguson for giving us a few minutes. Isaiah Wright from Fertile Bell Trambit will join us in just a few minutes about his commitment to uh, UND got a couple emails I want to get to here, cleaning up some stuff from earlier. Uh, Dom Grant Nelson was inconsistent, inconsistent offensively in the SEC this past year, which is clearly a step up from the Summit League. The NBA is yet another step up from the NCA and the SEC, and the physicality of pro basketball. Athletically, we saw a bit of what Grant can do in the last two games of the tournament. I think he needs some more physicality uh, to do it night in, night out during the 82 game grind. I'm a big fan of Grant. Hope he can take the next step. Clearly, that's part of it, what Mike was talking about. Also, the ability to play defense. you got to be able to do that or else you are a, a liability out there. They will find you, uh, and they will get you. There's no, there's no doubt about that. So I uh, appreciate the email uh, coming in uh, there. We'll see. I, as I mentioned with Mike's segment earlier, um, dead wrong on that one. I really thought we had seen his last days in college basketball, and he was – uh, going to move on to the next level, but uh, he will return. And again, now in, we're in this phase of where teams are still picking their rosters and putting them together. Uh, we really don't know what Alabama's basketball roster is going to look like. We do know he's part of it for the 24-25 uh, season. And be intrigued to see some of the games, non-conference games they have. That's that's the next part to me when we get into May and June and July is the schedule part of it, of who's playing who in the non-conference, uh, especially in basketball, is always entertaining. So uh, that will be intriguing. One other note, and I wanted to hit on this because it goes back to the email we got uh, earlier in the show. And this is a story from ESPN's Pete Thamel that there is some, and I always caution when I use this word, major movement, but there might be, that the leaders of college sports – put that in quotation marks, are involved in, quote, deep discussions to reach a legal settlement that would likely lay out the framework for sharing revenue with athletes in a future NCA business model. 
What that means, the NCAA is going to lose in court about an, an NIL lawsuit that was brought against him. And we're talking a lawsuit that would go into the billions of dollar range, that the NCAA would go bankrupt trying to pay it out. That's how I understood it. But if they can somehow make this deal, yeah, the plaint- if the plaintiffs were to win a trial, the NCAA and its schools could be liable to pay more than $4 billion in damages. They don't have that. They would go bankrupt. They'd have. That's why they're looking for a settlement. That's why they're trying to address this. So what that means for the athletes, for these monstrous television contracts that have been signed, it would now filter to the athletes, like you see in professional sports, where the NFL, the NBA is going through a major negotiation right now with TV. That goes to the players. It's not just all the owners, not just all the schools, In this instance, it would go to the athletes as well. And I think this is going to come about. The NCAA and its power conferences are defendants in an antitrust class action lawsuit, House versus the NCAA, which argues the association is breaking federal law by placing any restrictions on how athletes make money from selling the rights to their name, image, or likeness. The case is scheduled to go to court in January of 25. That's why there's impetus. That's why there's momentum to try to get this done. Something to keep an eye on, but this one looks like it could come to pass, and that would mean more money coming the athlete's way. They have to. If you're getting $6 billion deals for basketball, the SEC and ESPN, I think, was $4 billion. Big Ten just got something in the billions from NBC, Fox, and CBS. Big 12 got billions from ESPN and Fox. It's there. Schools just can't have it all to build, you know, huge facilities. The athletes can get a little bit of this, too. It looks like it may come to pass. We'll break. We come back. One of the top local athletes has made a commitment just this morning to play football at UND. Berto Beltrami's Isaiah Wright will join us when Hot Mike returns right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Our Tuesday morning spectacular. Holy cow, it's already 10.35. We're in the home stretch here. The UND football team has got its second commitment for the class of 2025, and both of them in local. Got one from Thompson, and today, one of the area's top players from Fertile Beltrami announced his commitment. Isaiah Wright announced uh, about an hour ago uh, that he is going to play football for Bubba Schweigert and UND in 2025, and he's good enough to join us uh, in his video editing class, which is fantastic. I want to ask about that in a second. Congratulations. Uh, tell me the 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 reason why is always one I want to know. Tell me why UND. What stood out to, to them about you? Definitely the coaching staff. I mean, all of them are so welcoming, and, I mean, they understand that I haven't played DB primarily. Like, it's not my main position, but – they're still going to put their time into me and invest in me to get me in that position. I know, uh, Isaiah, they offered you in March. What was that rea- when they offered you first? Like, okay, I'm, they think I'm good enough to play Division One football. Yeah, that was awesome. I was with my grandparents were with me, actually, and my grandma started crying. So <laughs> right then I knew it was a special moment. I mean, my mom, she moved to Minneapolis, so I wasn't able to share that special moment with her, but. Well, Saturday though, tell us that you were just visiting me off air. That you went and you were taught, you were an, on campus, and you you committed on the spot. Give us the story on that. Yeah, so we were in um, we were in the we went into Bubba's office, and I was with my uh, mom. Um, she came down for the weekend, and um, when we were talking, I was like, "He's, what are you thinking about?" And I was like, "Well, I wanna, I wanna come here, but I'm not sure." if I want to wait or do it now. So he was just kind of asking how I was feeling. And at the time I was feeling stressed because I wasn't sure, well, should I wait or should I commit on spot? Cause I knew I wanted to go here. This is where I want to be. Mm-hmm. So then after thinking about it and talking with it, with him, I decided that's where I want to be for the next four to five years. What was his reaction then? He was excited. He's like, Oh really? You want to commit right now? And I was like, yep. I mean, <laughs> Right before that talk, he had another person commit from, a, I believe, a JUCO college. So he got two commits that one day that I'm I'm aware of, at least. 
for you personally, what's the last couple days been like? Weight off your shoulders? What's the emotions been the last 48 hours? Yeah, it's been – it's definitely a relief. I don't have – I mean, I still have a bunch of coaches texting me. I mean, they're all showing support, telling me congratulations. So that's awesome on their part. But it's definitely – I'm not as stressed as I as I was. I mean, it was getting to be a lot. But he also <clears throat> helped me cope from that. So that was awesome on his part. I got to ask, we're watching video. I, I called your game two years ago when you played at the Dome in the section championship game when you – against Black Duck, and then you had the unreal game down at, at U.S. Bank Stadium, especially this past November where you had, I think, four touchdowns. Did that blow things up, like have that kind of performance at U.S. Bank Stadium? Did the spotlight then, did your phone go nuts after that? Like, hey, we want to talk to you. I didn't I didn't really get anything from that game, no believe kidding. it or not. I mean, I posted, I posted my highlights. I was hoping I'd get something out of it, but I think I got – um, there's the, uh, running back from, um, uh, Kingsland, he committed to Winona, but I think one of their coaches texted me and he actually transferred to UND from Winona. Yep. So that coach, he hit me up after the game. And I think that's about the only one, the all, the rest of them have all been camps and whatever. To have that kind of performance for you personally, I know you didn't win at U.S. Bank Stadium. What was that like to, to go and have that kind of game? It was awesome. I knew we lost our uh, our one fullback from um, a leg injury in the dome, so I knew that I had to step up and do what I do best. So I just gave it my all. I was we were all sick that day, so I just kept pushing and pushing because I wanted it bad, just as bad as everyone else. But we just fell a little bit short. To now have this done, I mean, you're getting ready for the off season, and then obviously your your senior year was that a was that a goal a timeline for you or just whenever it decided it felt right that's when you were going to commit. I wanted to wait till after my um, senior season because I'm gonna I know I'm gonna have a, a big senior season, mm-hmm. but I felt I should commit early to build a good relationship with all the players and coaches to benefit my college experience at the next level. For you personally, when did you get a sense that Division Division One football was the reality? Was it the offer? What when did you think, hey, somebody thinks I can play Division One football? It's it's just always been a dream of mine yeah. since I was little. My my mom always told me that I'm gonna go to the league, so I do it all for my mom and my grandparents. I mean, my dream is to buy it. my grandpa, he always wants a Bugatti, so that's <laughs> that's the number one thing I'm gonna I'm gonna get is get my grandpa a Bugatti. That's what I'm working for. Tell me your your family's reaction when you told them, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm going to go to UND." I, you mentioned obviously your your mom was with you, right? Yeah. What was that she like? Didn't, um, she she was shocked. She didn't know that I was gonna commit because before we went there, my plan was, was I was gonna tell them that I would like a little more time to speak with my family about it and figure out what I want to do. But whenever um, we were in there, I was talking to her, and she we're just going to stick with the plan that we're just going to tell them to wait. And I just told them that that's what I want to do. I want to be there. So today I got to ask now that it's out there. What is, uh, what's the last couple hours at school been like for you? Oh, it's been big. Everybody's congratulating me. My phone's blowing up. It's been awesome. Now you mentioned you're in video editing class. Tell me about that. Tell me about what uh, I'm intrigued. I, I edit video every day. What, tell me what you get a chance to do in class. So right now we're working on creating a movie trailer and we also have to make a music video at the same time. So we're just doing two projects at once just until the end of the year. So whatever, whenever we finish, we're done for the year. Now, were you working on your highlight video in class? (laughs) No, my mom (laughs) mom does all that. She, she makes them on huddle and I made one. I've I've made one of them my whole entire life and that was on cap cut. So I didn't even have to do anything. All right, so now this is over and done with. What are the, you are you celebrating tonight? Is it what are you what what are the plans after after school today? Uh, my plans. I'm gonna go hit the weight room most definitely <laughs> and uh, continue with track practice. So I'm gonna just keep doing what I'm doing and getting better each and every day. Well, I appreciate the time. I know you got to get back to school. Thanks so much for doing this. Congratulations, and uh, we can't wait to see you playing this fall. All right. Thank you very much. There he goes. Isaiah Wright from Fertile Beltrami High School. Brian Nelson's uh, standout. We got to see him, and you saw 
uh, some of the highlights. We uh, we televised that game. I did the play-by-play for that one, and I had heard about him uh, just doing a little bit of research, getting ready for the game. So, hey, keep an eye on number two. He's really good. And you hear that, like, right, Minnesota nine-man good or how good? And you saw some of the clips. Like, he is electric. He's got some tremendous speed. I love this stat that's on his uh, his Twitter page. And this is his end-of-the-year stats for 2023. Finished with 1,655 rushing yards, 27 touchdowns, had 20 receptions for 405 yards and four touchdowns. But this is the best part. At the top, it says, rarely played in the second half until playoffs because Fertile was killing everybody that he didn't have to play. And I think that's an important distinction, especially for the smaller school kids that may not get the type of notoriety or attention that, you know, a player from the Twin Cities would get that they have to throw it out there. Well, wait a minute. His stats aren't uh, that outrageous. Well, there's a caveat to that, that they were way ahead in games. There was no reason to have their best player uh, in the game. Real quick, just before we uh, – before we break, they finished 12 and one. We mentioned they lost in the state championship game uh, to Kingsland, but throughout the season, regular season, these are the scores for Fertile: 42 to 12, 58 14, 42 nothing, 57 nothing, 55 16, 57 to six, 67 to eight, and 46 to nothing. There's no reason to play when you're up by that much. Heck, the playoffs they won in section tournament 50 to 18. The section championship game, when they beat uh, Clearbrook Gonvick, they won 52 to 20. They cruised over everybody this season. Even the game that they played over at Moorhead, they played at Jim Gota Stadium for the first round of the state tournament. They won that game 35 to 6 against Goodrich Grigla. So, I mean, they handled everybody this season. And congratulations to, uh, to Isaiah. So UND's got two commits for the class of 2025. The Bison have one. I know that some fans keep track of that. It's always intriguing. I would imagine now as we sit here, April 30th, May's going to be busy. May, I imagine, will be fast and furious on the commitment front. But uh, congratulations to Isaiah. He's uh, the second. And uh, much more on him coming up on our news tonight at 6 out of 10. We'll take our final break. We come back. We'll get you ready for a busy Sports Tuesday. We'll do that when Hot Mike wraps. Sun is out. Finally, back after this. All right, wrapping things up here on this Tuesday morning. Tomorrow, Bison Media Zone is back. Jory Collins will join us during that segment tomorrow. North Dakota State women's basketball head coach will join us tomorrow during the BMZ at about 1035. Looking forward to our conversation there with the head coach of the Bison women after what's been an eventful last 30 days since the Bison women's season ended, what is it, March 29th, I want to say, in Minnesota. To today, which is April 30th, plenty has happened. Obviously, L. Evans went into the portal. Uh, the Bison have added three new players, two transfers, and it will be a new-look team with Heaven Hamling and L. Evans gone. Uh, Expectation-wise, I know won't change considering they made it to the Summit League Championship game and won a game in the WNIT tournament that they have high goals for 2025. So we'll visit with Jory coming up uh, tomorrow. Also on the show... Uh, former Bison standout corner Jaden Price will join us about uh, signing a deal with the Atlanta Falcons. That'll come up tomorrow on the show. So looking forward to that. Big pieces uh, of our show coming up uh, tomorrow. Looking forward uh, to making that happen. Matt Fetch from the North Dakota High School Activities Association will also join us uh, later in the week about some big news coming out of the association. That'll be on Thursday. So uh, just set your lineups accordingly for those that uh, like to check in on the show. We've got that. Big night tonight. I know everybody is excited. The CFL draft is tonight. I'm looking through the potential picks here. I don't anticipate anybody locally going, but uh, we'll keep an eye on that uh, because their season is right around the corner 
I believe they start, what, at the end of June, I want to say, uh, for the CFL, and they go all the way to November. So uh, we'll uh, keep our eyes posted on that. In the NHL, by the way, news came out today, wild defenseman Brock Faber, one of the finalists for the Calder Trophy that goes to the Rookie of the Year. If there's any way it's not Connor Bedard, it's like the NBA. There's no way it's not going to be Wembenyama is going to be the Rookie of the Year in the NBA. Same for Connor Bedard, the number one pick with the Blackhawks. Uh, we are steamrolling along in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Last night, uh, we had a couple of dramatic games there, including the Stars beating Vegas. So no home team has won a game in that series. That's now even up at uh, two games apiece with Game 5 coming up. This is where everything is at. Two teams have advanced. The Rangers swept out the Capitals. The Panthers eliminated the Lightning last night. You remember Florida made it all the way to the Stanley Cup final uh, a year ago. Boston can eliminate Toronto tonight, which we'll get to and what to watch in a second. And the Islanders are trying to stave off elimination again. They're down 3-1 to the Hurricanes. Game 5 of that series is tonight. The Avalanche can eliminate the Jets tonight in Winnipeg. Game 5 of that series. Colorado's up 3 games to 1. And Vancouver is up 3 games to 1 on Nashville. They can eliminate the Predators if they win tonight. So literally, we could have four series end tonight. These are all closeout games in the NHL in the Stanley Cup playoffs. The other uh, series still going, we mentioned, is the Kings and the Oilers. Edmonton's up 3-1 on L.A., and we mentioned the Dallas-Vegas series is going to go at least six. It's atypical, especially in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, for you not to get a couple of seven-game series. That's what I'm hoping for. The longer, the better in a series. If you have it over in four, like what the Wolves did, the Wolves just kicked the you-know-what out of the Suns, that that was done. Or in five, like what the Lakers and Nuggets series went uh, last night. Now, the crazy part is, I think the NHL will actually move up the calendar. The NBA is going to say, nah, we'll wait, get a week off. The NBA Finals, I looked at this yesterday because, of course, WDAY this year has both the NBA Finals and the Stanley Cup Final this year. The Stanley Cup Final begins, I want to say, June 10th. Hockey's going to go longer than basketball this year. That's outrageous. There's no way that should happen. The NBA Final Game 7, if there is a Game 7, will be played June 23rd. Think about that. June 23rd is when the NBA final, the last game would be. I believe the Stanley Cup final, if I got uh, the dates right on this, they could move it up, but it potentially could start either June 8th or June 10th. That is late to be playing hockey. I mean, I love it, but that is that's a long season to be wrapping up. So we'll see, but uh, we could have four series end tonight. In the, uh, in the Stanley Cup playoffs. The Twins, mind you, as well. As we'll get to that in just a second. Playing their second game against the White Sox coming up uh, later tonight. We do it every day. Let's do some What to Watch before we get out of here. All right, speaking of the Twins, they go for a ninth straight win tonight as they take on the Chicago White Sox. 6.30 tonight on Bally Sports North for game two of that three-game set. Again, they've won eight in a row. They may never lose a game again. We got on them all uh, of April, and now the calendar sets to turn to May, and they can't lose. Simeon Woods-Richardson against Michael Sirocco will be the starters tonight in Chicago. Game 5, 76ers and the Knicks tonight, 6 o'clock on TNT. The Knicks lead that series three games to one, trying to knock out the Sixers. They would get a date with the Indiana Pacers, likely, unless the Bucks offer the greatest comeback not ever, but probably greatest comeback in a while, down 3-1 without Giannis, without Dame Lillard. That's where the Bucks are at. But uh, that coming up tonight, 76ers of the Knicks, 6 o'clock on TNT. And Game 5 in Boston, Maple Leafs and the Bruins, 6 o'clock on ESPN. And now Boston's in the same spot they were last year. Remember, the Bruins had the best regular season ever and then lost a 3-1 lead to Florida 
losing three straight games. And the Panthers, of course, went on to the Stanley Cup final. And Boston now with a chance to eliminate their arch rivals in Toronto. And the Maple Leafs can keep their long, long, long losing streak of not getting to the Stanley Cup final. That's going at 60-some-odd years. And uh, if they lose tonight, that uh, that will not go over well in Toronto. We'll see what happens coming up uh, tonight there. We got to roll. Thanks to our guests today, to Mike McFeely, to Rachel Bergeson, and to Isaiah Wright. If you missed any of the show, you can podcast it later today at Inforum.com. Enjoy the beautiful weather we have, at least for now, folks. And thanks for joining us. We're back tomorrow here on Hot Mike on WDAY Extra, KSFL-TV, and Inforum.com. Have a great Tuesday, everybody. See you tomorrow.